Hello and welcome to the Keystone Kickoff Show. I'm Jim Gallant. T along with our T Frank, how are we doing today? Pretty good. How are you doing, Jim? I'm doing very well, sir. We are getting closer and closer to uh, the spring game, which reminds me, I'll tell you what, if you're interested in tailgating, the best way to tailgate is Revel XP, and they will be set up for the spring game. If you're ready to tailgate close to the stadium with tents, tables, chairs, and all of that set up for you ahead of time, check out RevelXP.com. They could even help you get your catering done. And by the way, we at Keystone Sports, we're going to be there doing our tailgating also. So check out RevelXP.com and experience turnkey tailgating. All right, T. Frank, it's time to talk some Penn State football right in the middle of spring practice. As I mentioned, not too far away from the spring game. You wrote an article this was interesting to me. You talked offensive line. There's never a bad time to talk about the offensive line, is there? Oh, there is. And usually it's after the, <laughs> the, the, the offense hasn't done very well. And I have to explain, hey, guys, th the offensive line did their job. And then everyone gets bah, 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 bah. And, and so, yes, th there's a select few times where it's not. But, uh, yeah, generally the five guys up front is super interesting to me. So uh, I'm excited to get into it. I, I so am I. Let's. Let's start with this. Let's start with where they were a year ago, transitioning to this season. The big transition is losing both tackles. Uh, Olu Fashanu, we know how good he is. We know he's definitely a first-round pick, top half of the first round. And Caden Wallace, who I thought, at least I think, may have been a little bit underrated, T. Frank. They both had pretty good years last season, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, Olu Fashinu had a good year. That's uh, that's an understatement. Just generally the last two years of him as a football player, some of the best tackle play we've seen. I don't remember the last one, and that's not saying much because my memory doesn't go much beyond the James Franklin years. I started covering football at that point. So, you know, 10 years is, is a decent chunk of time. And then Caden Wallace, I, I think, you know, it's never perfect. It wasn't perfect with Caden, but it isn't with most offensive linemen. But he was very good, and he turned into a very reliable football player. Um, and to lose then Hunter Norzad on top of that, there are three positions that you start to build an offensive line with. Tackle, left tackle, right tackle actually are pretty, I don't want to say interchangeable, but they are both vitally important in modern football with all the pass rushers we have. And then center. And you, you that you build from there, and so Penn State has a lot of retooling to do on the offensive line. The good news is, for the first time under James Franklin, they have multiple options at tackle. And that's the optimism for this spring. But then the reality of <laughs> how are you going to build the offensive line? How are you going to build around any deficiencies they may have? And then the complicating factor that you won't have Drew Shelton in spring football to find out what you're good at. I think those are all some of the things that Penn State has to work through, given the optimism at the position so far. Obviously, when you lose a left tackle who's a first-round draft pick like Olu is, you're going to miss him. But when you wrote this last week, you, you actually said, are they going to miss Olu? Yes and no. Yeah. Could you explain what you meant by that? So you're not going to replace Olu Fashanu. And there's what I did is I compared <laughs> what I've been doing all offseason is comparing Penn State's offense in 2021 through 2023 and Kansas. And um, there's some there's some nuance to this conversation of your players dictate what you do. So Penn State had a drop back passer who has a good mental understanding of the game, although he needs to produce. Um, and they had two bookend tackles. So you're going to throw the ball more in pure progression football. You're, you're going to try and lean into the things that if you can do them well, make you a winner at the highest level. Um, so they threw the ball and put their offense in uh, obvious passing situations. Not a whole lot, honestly, when you look at the, the totality of college football. But compared to Kansas, it was quite a bit. It was a lot more. So if we look at what Andy Konelnicki has done, he will adapt his offense to what Penn State can do. But there are features and functions of this offense that can de-emphasize the drop-back passing game. 
where you can use different tools and honestly running the ball better and running the ball more consistently is, a, is something you should expect from this offense so you won't be in as many third and long situations so you can de-emphasize Olu Fashanu's uh, effect on the offense by not putting the team in situations where his best asset gave them the comfort to drop back on third and nine and run 10 yard routes. They don't have to do it the same way this upcoming season and they won't under Andy Cole, Nicky. Now the question again, like I I'll just restate this part is which parts of the playbook is he going to accentuate? What are we going to see from this offense that is different than Kansas? Even if all of the elements are transported over, they, they, they file control C control V and bring all of it. You're not calling everything in the same proportions that's going to dictate the nature of this offense. And I just looking at the tackle situation, if they don't feel comfortable with the guys on the outside, we've seen this offense be productive without some of those things uh, embedded in the offense. All right. You mentioned Drew Shelton missing uh, spring practice and having him not there is not a good thing. Okay. You can't paint it as, as a good thing except other guys get more reps. I hear that. I understand that. But if this is the guy that you anticipate being your starting left tackle, especially with the new offensive coordinator, you wish he was there. Let me start with this. Are you comfortable, especially just missing the spring? Let's assume Drew Shelton is uh, healthy and ready that way come August. Are you comfortable just placing Drew Shelton in as your starting left tackle? No. I mean, I, I would, I, I, <laughs> from my assessment of uh, Shelton's performance over the first two years, um, I would say at this point, no. And so it's not even necessarily his fault. You know, he had this injury, right? And that is something we didn't know watching his film last year that he had sustained an injury and decided to play through it. I don't know at what point in the year. I don't know the severity of the injury. I can have some guesses and assumptions of what you can and can't play through. But um, it affected him in a way that was obvious, where he became a bad run blocker. There were things he was doing, especially in the bowl game, that were atypical of what we'd seen from him in the past. But there are still things that, going back to the blue-white game, watching deny Dennis Sutton uh, eviscerate him in pass protection that are concerning and it's not just that deny is a good football player drew shelton is now the starting left tackle so you've got to be good you can't just be well he's good for a freshman that is that train has sailed so you need to now put in the work to be good at the position so I, it's ambivalent for me of i want to give him the opportunity to get better i want to give him the opportunity to um be injured but at the same time there are consistent through lines of his pass protection that are concerning and you said other guys get reps here in the spring. He needs them. He's the guy that if he's going to be the starter, he needs them. And the guys behind him in that position that we've outlined, J.B. Nelson and Javen Williams. J.B. Nelson, you'd like to have him at guard, although everyone is confident he can play tackle. We've had that evaluation of him since Lackawanna, where he played left tackle and looked good doing it. I, and I know it's Lackawanna, but there are translatable skills that you can see from a physical standpoint. But you'd still like to have your best player out there. Javen Williams still young, coming from a similar situation of uh, being in a high school offense that never asked him to pass block, having to get bigger physically, all those things. So unless you're moving a tackle from the right side, which I think everyone is trying to like backdoor Nolan Rucci to, to the left tackle position through the spring. Um, yeah, I don't think anyone feels terribly comfortable with the situation, which is why you then go to, hey, how can the offense help out this position so that we can emphasize whoever is there, their strengths, as opposed to what you're supposed to do at the position, which is, you know, be a pass blocker and elite feet and all those things, which Shelton maybe someday, but we have no evidence that he is right now. If there is an issue with Drew Shelton, are those the options at left tackle, JB Nelson and Nolan Rucci and give us the scouting report on those two or would they be ready to take over so the jb nelson has been the backup emergency tackle for uh, last year and then he was hurt for most of the year so he didn't even start at left guard <laughs> so there's a little bit of they 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 have been getting 
more breaks when it comes to players staying healthy and having a consistent five offensive linemen, but not all of them, you know, like they've, they, there's been some attrition here where Nelson and apparently Shelton were injured last year. So, uh, JB Nelson would be the guy he, we saw him at left tackle last spring as well. And then I think, you know, if, if, if you hit the panic button or bleep hits the fan, then I think any option is open. So that means Anthony Donko. You could say, Anthony, can you play left tackle? Nolan, Rucci, all of these options at tackle, you know, you're not going to, out of principle, put bad players in a position to fail. You're going to try and find your best five offensive linemen. So anything at this point is possible. And we might see during the blue-white game that play out where suddenly guys are switching sides of the offensive line, guys are moving positions, and you know, from tackled guard, guard to tackle, etc., depending on what they find out over the next couple of weeks. So I think anything is on the table, and what we have is a starting point when we talk about J.B. Nelson and Javen Williams at the left tackle position. All right, let's go to the other side, the right tackle. Anthony Donka last year is a true freshman. Uh, he was playing mostly guard right during the season, but late in the season, approaching the bowl game, he's all of a sudden uh, moved to right tackle for the bowl game. Evaluate his performance in that bowl game and what you see from him going forward. Yeah, it's so we don't have a full time to get into all of it, but his story is crazy where he's playing left guard all year. And then the second to last or the last game of the season, uh, they say, hey, can you play tackle? Do a couple reps. And then he won them. And then suddenly he's playing tackle against an SEC team a month later and looked really good doing it. So he he graded out really well. There are some things he's going to have to learn and that I want to learn more about him. But he's athletic. He is strong. He is violent. He is all the things you want in a complete offensive lineman. I'm just curious to see what is, what are his, what's his eye discipline? How does he work with stunts? And how does he pass off? And pick up blockers really well because that was a problem for Penn State last year and um you know just what what's the polish level on a guy who has all this raw potential at the position and then behind him Nolan Rucci the most athletic offensive lineman I've seen that I've scouted when they were at the high school level and he's gonna play right tackle for Penn State but he's athletic enough 315 now he can play either position depending on his technique and where he develops and how he grows as a football player so again that's the optimism. They've got a lot of really talented football players. They just have to accelerate the growing process so they're ready by training camp and then the fall. Very good, T. Frank. That's it for quarter number one. But that is not it for our offensive line conversation. We're going to pick it up when we come back for quarter number two. Hello and welcome back on kickoff show. He is T. Frank. I am Jim we're talking Penn State football, and specifically, we're talking Penn State offensive line. Uh, T. Frank, you did a couple articles this week. Uh, real quick, tell our folks where you could get to your stuff. Again, I say it every week. I love your writing. Love you on the show, too, buddy. But I also like your writing. That fills me in for my T. Frank fix during the week until I get a chance to actually talk to you. Where could our listeners get everything that T. Frank does? Yeah, bluewhiteillustrated.com. Appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about that. Um, we have a special deal for all people that find us on uh, radio or YouTube or podcast, where if you want to try out the site, you want to get... So I put out a film room. Anthony Kotalink, uh, Andy Kotalinki put out, uh, talked about his his creativity, and I asked him about outside zone and using distortion to create some opportunities for the offense in the defense, creating distortion in the defense. So I went to the film. I found plays that describe that, and then I showed it to you so you don't have to wonder what that means. You can check that out at bluewhiteillustrated.com, and if you sign up right now using the promo code PSU1 for our radio, podcast, and uh, YouTube viewers, you get an extra month to try it out. So one month, or two months for $1. I'm dyslexic, so I always get that backwards. Use the promo code <laughs> PSU1. Uh, absolutely a great deal. Like I said, I read uh, T. Frank stuff and every all the stuff from the guys over there um, at Blue White Illustrated. Love everybody over there. Great stuff. One of the best deals. It, I'm assuming you're a Penn State fan if you're listening to us, T. Frank. So if you're a Penn State fan, you got to pick that up. That's Blue White Illustrated and a great deal going on right now. All right, T. Frank, we've been talking about the offensive line and it's fascinating, and there are so many pieces there. It's like a puzzle to put together. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the tackle 
let's kind of play conversation and wrap it up. The assumption I think us fans have had is Drew Shelton, he'll be out in the spring, but he's the left tackle. Uh, Anthony Donka, he played well in the bowl game. There's your right tackle. Maybe not quite so fast because J.B. Nelson and Nolan Rucci could be part of this. And I wanted to ask you about Nolan Rucci and specifically his weight gain. I know we talked about this a little bit. I found that fascinating that James Franklin talked about a guy 300 pounds and said, he looks skinny at 300 pounds, and they already have him up to 315. Yeah. How big a deal is that uh, for a Nolan Rucci to put on some weight from your perspective? So uh, I want to say that he was 300 pounds when he got here, and about seven pounds of it were mullet, too. So, like, you know, the, the <laughs> weight ratio needed to change a little bit. I mean, it's it's both nothing and everything. So on average... Football players that are bigger are stronger and therefore more effective at their job. But there are certain players that defy that particular logic where you can be, if you're strong, aggressive, violent, and explosive, you can overcome a size difference and be a better football player. I, you know, it's not uh, anything terribly creative. And I think that this is just an industry industry thing, but it's called punching above your weight, right? Like in, in boxing, like you're stronger than your weight card would say. So Nolan can play at 300 pounds if he is aggressive and strong and has a natural baseline of power and uh, explosiveness that defy his size. Most guys don't. So Penn State brings him in. And they do what they do with most athletes, where they put them through their weight training program and their nutrition program, and they give him the tools to succeed. The problem is sometimes players, their natural frame, Penn State miscalculates um, in, in a recruit, and that guy can't put on the weight. Uh, I think Adisa Isaac is a situation where he was as big as he could be. He's 249 pounds, and that seems like where he was maxed out. That's big enough, but it's not – when you saw him as a as a prospective high school athlete, you might think this guy could be 255, be prototype size, but he's just a little narrow. And, and that's just an example of my speculation, right, of a guy who's got a big frame but didn't quite grow into a full prototype of the position. Nolan Rucci's almost 6'8". He's got a wide frame, huge base, and hyper-athleticism for his size. So why didn't he put on the weight at, at Wisconsin? Well, he's in the transfer portal. So I think some of that stuff answers itself. Like whatever was going on at Wisconsin was not developing Nolan Rucci. And so he gets to Penn State and he puts on, on a, on a 6'8 frame, 315 pounds is not all that much muscle. Like it is a positive growth, but it's not like he went, it's not like he gained 50 pounds of muscle, right? So, you know, things that defy the science of the sport and the science of, of, of training and progression. So I'm just like extreme examples here. Don't use any of these as, as benchmarks for reality. So it's good, but how does that weight work for him right now? Is he, str is he legitimately stronger? Has, has he been able to train the muscle that he's gained? So he's able to use it. Like there are added layers to all of this stuff other than just the weight the the actual number that's almost like a starting point gotcha so putting on 15 pounds when you're six foot eight may not be that big a deal it doesn't it doesn't answer the question so like it is a good first step does it answer the question that he's ready to play i don't think it answers the question that he's ready to play and be strong and move guys off the ball Unfortunately, when you're five foot seven, 15 pounds does make a difference, T. Frank. Oh, a for sure. Significant one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it may sound like I'm talking from experience. It's only because I am. All right. We talked <laughs> quite a bit about the tackles. <laughs> Let's get to the interior uh, of the offensive line, uh, where at least at guards, there's a lot of returning experience. Let's start with Sal Warmly, mm -hmm. who actually. He talked about you. You talked about this in the article that he's quoted talking about wanting to be more physical, correct? Yeah, and I never know what to do with this particular conversation because there's film and there's the data back up, backing up the film. And I want to say 2022, Sal was a good football player. They used him and his strength in certain 
offensive situations was to pull and to kick out a defensive end. He became pretty good at that, where I thought that was a strength in his game. They pulled much less last year. So he was not doing things that he was better at. Um, and when when they did have him do those things without Brenton Strange, that particular system of running the football struggled. So that's why they didn't do a lot of counters and powers like they had previously. Um, so that's one part of the conversation. That's the film aspect. But when you look, when you step back and, and you look in totality at what he's done as a, as a blocker, those positive run blocks are a part of the whole. And on the whole, Sal Wormley has been a good offensive lineman, a good Big Ten offensive lineman, meaning like, you know, I, there aren't any metrics to really gauge run blocking tenacity and physicality. Um, so what we have is PFF run blocking grade where they go through and they get judge good or bad on every play and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the short answer is he's been an average offensive lineman, literally. So 60 on the PFF grading scale is, uh, is, is zero. Uh, 59.9 is a negative 60.1 is a positive. He was a 60 last year, dead on. And he was a 63 the year before. So that is not saying he's bad. That is saying he is doing exactly what's expected of him, but not generating positivity on a consistent basis to outweigh any negatives to give him a positive grade. So he's he wants to do that this year. He wants to be more physical, more dominant in these run blocks and open up easy running lanes for the running backs. And, and I think that, you know, he's capable of doing it. He's a big, strong kid. He's now old for college football, so he's going to have a he's going to have a maturity advantage. And if there's a time for a guy to have a breakout season at that position later on, it would be this year. OK, now on the other side, we talked about J.B. Nelson being a swing guy, guard tackle. The other guy talked about is Vega Ioane. I think when he first got here, we were all pretty excited about him. What are you seeing from him now? I have not much <laughs> like he's one guy we haven't <laughs> talked about. I haven't been able to see too much of him. I gave a, a chance to literally just glimpse him in practice. And he, he always looks great, right? He always looks really good. I think he was a guy who came in with a lot of talent and a lot of physical ability, but had not maximized it totally yet. When, when I was last, and this is what I mean, and this is anecdotal. So I could be completely off on this. So just give me a little bit of grace here to be wrong. Um, he was not among the guys that was squatting the most last year, where when we got into the weight room and we got to see some of the guys who were putting up like ridiculous weight, I, I want to say JB Nelson was moving a lot of weight and for his size for 350 pounds, um, Vega was obviously abnormal for a normal human, but not necessarily abnormal for a guy who's 350. So I think he's a guy who's developing strength and, and kind of that. I always think of it like an old growth tree, like your muscles, especially in your legs are like tree trunks and you've got to abuse them in the weight room so that they harden and you get those rings that are tightly packed together. And that's how you grow like strength, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Um, and he just needed more time to kind of fill out that the volume that he has needs to fill out with that strength profile. So I, I think that, that this is a year where he can take a significant step and be a dominant run blocker there were times last year that i don't know if it was a mental thing if he was thinking too much but again for his size we didn't see i think maybe the dominance we expected from a guy who uh is as quick as he is and as big as he is so i don't know if that's expectations are wrong or if he is just developing and even guys who are abnormally sized need some time to develop in the weight room so I think he's obviously a huge part of what they're going to do up front, but is he going to be a mauler that destroys people or is he going to be a good, really good offensive lineman? And there's kind of a, a range of outcomes that I still need to understand and see from him uh, as we go through spring and then into fall camp. And obviously once we see it, once it's on the field. Okay. The last spot to talk about is center. I don't want to shortchange Nick Dawkins, but the excitement is all about true freshman Cooper cousins. You know, we always love the shiny new freshman coming in. That yeah. guy is Cooper Cousins. What you've seen so far from him? So I want to talk about the interior. And I know we don't have a ton of time, but I want to talk about the interior as a whole. Because one of the things I've been thinking is if you borrow J.B. Nelson for tackle, short term or long term, who knows? It, this is a deep group up front, but there has to be somebody that steps up and there to replenish that depth because 
you do lose Hunter Norzad, and you need to make sure that you have that too deep somewhere along the interior of the offensive line where you've worked so hard to build it up. You need somebody to step into that hole. And Cooper Cousins is ahead of schedule, but Alex Birchmeyer has to be a part of the conversation as well. Whoever, one of these young guys has to be a part of the conversation. Sal um, uh, Wormley is a known. You've got uh, Vega Iwane is a known, but you need a young guy to kind of step into the void. And Nick Dawkins, um, I think if he were to be the starting center, that gives them the ability to play Cooper Cousins wherever he can get to the field. And if he's starting at center right now, he has the ability to play guard later. So he can fill in on any, theoretically, in all five positions, but focusing on the interior... And I think despite fans wanting him to start, maybe the best outcome is that he can play any of those positions because he has that versatility, given he doesn't have to start anywhere. All right, T. Frank, that's it for quarter two. Stick around. Quarter three, your questions, and we ask T. Frank. Stay tuned for that. Hello and welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. I'm Jim. He's T. Frank. It's quarter three, which means it's time for your questions. And we ask T. Frank, if you want to ask a question of T. Frank, just download our app, Keystone Sports. You'll see the Ask T. Frank button, and away you go. T. Frank, before we get to the questions, let's just finish up the conversation that we had. Um, You were talking about the interior of the offensive line. I didn't give you much time to answer that question, so I'm going to give you that time right now. Yeah, so the the, (laughs) I said at the end there, um, the best possible outcome is that Nick Dawkins is the starter and Cooper Cousins can play a bunch of interior positions. The unsaid part of that, that I think should be obvious, but I just want to be painfully obvious, is that that means Nick Dawkins is is good enough to play. So he's good enough to be the starter. You have found, you know, essentially a starter. So it's from a holistic sense of where do you have the most depth and the most talented depth? So if Cooper doesn't have to start, it gives them a massive advantage to play him where they want, when they want, which can get him closer to, you know, more reps. And and the the inverse of that is that Nick Dawkins, I've seen him play center and guard, and I think he has to play center. Like, I don't know that he has the versatility. I haven't been super impressed with his performance in certain situations overall but you know at those guard positions i think he's a center only sort of body type and player so that means like if you want to make sure you have as much depth as possible holistically nick dawkins starting at center and being good and you know being good enough to give you a winning formula gives cooper cousins the ability to see snaps where he's needed instead of having to fill that role up front so i think that's that's the nuance behind what i was trying to say there at the end And, of course, that's the best scenario overall. You have the veteran who could play one year. You could ease your freshman in, get him some experience, and not have the pressure of being the guy right out of the gate, especially for a freshman to play center, right? Yeah, but if he is, if he is the guy, then play him. Like, I'm not saying don't play him. Um, And this is also with the caveat in in this situation where J.B. Nelson is playing tackle. When you have JB Nelson, you have three guards on the interior. You have essentially three starters, so you're they're fine. But we've seen where fine goes to emergency pretty quickly. So this is kind of a contingency conversation that I'm thinking of trying to plan all the eventualities. The reality is, if you have Drew Shelton and you feel good about that, then you don't have any problems. But you know, if and when these are the kind of the the second step thoughts I've been having about the offensive line. Very good. All right, let's get to our listener questions, T. Frank. Let's start with Carl in Newcastle, who says, can you give a scouting report on the two young tight ends, Andrew Rapelier and Luke Reynolds? Who do you think has the higher ceiling? And you do, do you see them both on the field together in the future with complementary skills? I do, yes. I, I'm Carl, thank you for not saying this year. <laughs> because um, they are they are different. Uh, Andrew Rappelier, and this is going to be a shortcut conversation. I don't believe what I'm about to say. Andrew Rappelier is Pat Fryermuth. Luke Reynolds is Mike Gesicki. So those are their skill sets. But I think Luke Reynolds has the opportunity to be a good run blocker. I think Andrew Rappelier has a, the opportunity to be a better athlete than Pat Fryermuth. But those are kind of the mentality and what are the accentuated strengths of those players. Rappelier, I think, might be the best run blocker on the team at the tight end position. 
once he gets a little more experience, where he's going to be a better run blocker than Tyler Warren. That's how his profile works. He's a good route runner. I think he's a good athlete. Luke Reynolds is a hyper athlete. And uh, I said this uh, earlier this week when somebody, or do we have a, I do a Sunday mailbag when we have extra questions from the live show. Somebody asked me about Luke Reynolds and where he is in his progression and et cetera. You know, I don't have the insider information for you, but I have my observations from practice and he looks like a receiver. So I don't want the, to open the conversation of can he play receiver? No, I don't believe he would be playing receiver. But the point is he needs to get bigger and stronger. He needs to grow into his frame to be a guy that can then play tight end full time. So he's not this year, Carl, you nailed it, talking about in the future. And they do have complementary skills. I do think they would be a great combination. Uh, where and how they fit together, we'll find out once they develop. And, and that's where Reynolds has to do that developing. Well, I think Carl understands that we've seen multiple tight ends playing that because there's so much talent in the tight end room. Unfortunately, it's also made up for the lack of talent in the wide receiver room. So having both play... And I did get a chance to see Luke Reynolds live. It, it is a frame that could carry a lot more weight. It, yeah. Again, oh, a and, lot and of by the way, are that way. Yeah, I don't think he's weak, by the way. So, like, um, uh, he gave me a fist bump the other day. You know, I saw him, I think, in the weight room or something like that when we were there for media availability. Gave me a fist bump. And, like, normally you get a fist bump and it's fine. Like, his knuckles are the size of <laughs> gravel. Like, he is a strong kid, and he is, like, physically impressive. He just needs time to grow into his body, and that that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying he's weak. I'm not saying any of those things. Like I said, I think he could be a guy that can do everything, but time on task. We've seen it takes a little bit of – it takes a little bit longer than fans want to admit to learn how to run block. It is, it is a skill when you're a guy that plays mostly receiver in high school that you need to learn at the college level. Well, and the other thing, T. Frank, and it seems to be a bit of a trend. There's also those long, tight. Uh, I'm sorry, tackles, offensive tackles that they're bringing in. And we had, had did an event where we got to meet them, and you just see, yes, it's not like they're not strong, but you could see the frame is there to carry a lot more weight pretty easily. And again, that's just me as a lay person looking at them. Uh, you could see that. All right, let's go to Tom in Silver Spring who says, T. Frank, do you think previously being a head coach can help a coordinator? And if so. Yes, it can help them be a coordinator. More importantly, it can help the team. So you understand on a deeper level, on a personal level, what it is to be the head coach. So you understand what you need to take care of to take that off the plate of the head coach so he can focus on all the things that he needs to do, which is, you know, be the face of the program, be the manager of the, uh, of the entire organization, recruiting, um, finance, all those things that nobody wants to talk about. That is the job of the CEO position in, in, uh, college football. And then you can handle the X's and O's and the day-to-day -day of running your side of the, of the football. And then you have a fuller understanding of the opposite side. So if you're a head coach, that you're a defensive-minded coach, my, my concern always with defensive-minded coaches is they look at the offense with suspicion because that's been their job is to stop offense their whole career. And they end up stopping their own offense. Um, because they focus on the wrong things like, oh, I hate it when teams can run the football on us. And it's like, well, maybe you should focus on having a balanced offense. Um, and then when you're an offensive guy, you need to understand that you can't put you can't put your defense in a position to fail continuously. You need to give them the opportunity to be good as well. So you have this balanced understanding of football that isn't one or the other. And some guys have that naturally. Some guys just get that. And some guys need to learn it as being a head coach. So those are the areas where I think it does make you a better coordinator. Um, understanding here that these are some of the conversations that we've had with James Franklin. These are not any experience of my own. Uh, being coach or having any sort of actual knowledge. So like this, the terms and conditions apply to my answer on that one. <laughs> well, just talking to someone who has been in the room, which is our buddy Landon, he has talked about Manny Diaz and his ability to talk to the whole team and mm -hmm. have a voice like a head coach. And he said, there's a difference. <clears throat> and that was something that struck Landon that made Manny Diaz a bit different and also made him effective as a defensive coordinator. So just having that kind of voice, hopefully that's the same way with Tom Allen. Now, 
you put terms and conditions on your previous answer. Apparently, Alex from Richmond doesn't want to hear T. Frank about you not having the answers, not being in the room. You'll understand right. why when I give you the question. This is Alex again from Richmond. He says, T. Frank, this seems like the kind of question that Jim would ask you. If James Franklin pulled you aside and asked you for some coaching advice, what would you tell him? <laughs> yeah. and by the way, Alex is right. That is the kind of question I would ask you, T. Frank. You know that. I don't even know how to answer this question because honestly, if that happened, I would be stunned into silence. I'd be like, I, J James, you might want to quit if you're asking me for opinion for an opinion. Like, I, I, it's not a, it's not a lack of confidence in myself. It's, it's a, uh, 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 you're you're scraping the bottom of the barrel here, guy. Um, what are the things I believe? The problem is like, I believe, and I've said this many times on the show. I believe James Franklin has a firm understanding of the proper way to build a team and the proper philosophical um, guideposts that you should have when you want to set an, a, you know, your, your course for success. Where are you trying to get to? Explosive plays, being threatening in the run in the past game with, you know, trying to score points, giving your defense the opportunity to take the ball away, for, uh, emphasizing turnovers and disruption. All that stuff is correct, you know, like, so then it becomes a conversation about how, how you're getting to those spots. And, and it, that's a conversation like, I, you know, I, I can't, I think, and this is just the, this is the one thing coming off the conversation about Andrew Rappelier, Rappelier and Luke Reynolds is tight ends are great. Ch game changing tight ends change the game. But how many of those guys are you actually going to come across? where they're not just NFL players, but they are the top of the top of the top. And can they be difference makers on the college level as opposed to a receiver? But here's the thing. James Franklin knows that. They're just, <laughs> it's easier to get an elite tight end as compared to an elite receiver. That is proof, like so far, that they have had a better job of getting these elite tight ends instead of elite receivers. So I would give him unhelpful advice of, hey, James, go get a, go get a bona fide explosive receiver. He'd be like, no, no, duh, dummy. <laughs> what do you think we've been trying to do? So, yeah, I, I, I don't think I have any good advice. It would just be, you know, uh, emphasizing the things that I believe in. It did sound like you were very close to saying a word you shouldn't say on the radio. Chief. Yeah, no, no split, right. Sherlock, was kind of where I was going. <laughs> I got it. All right, let's quickly sneak in one more. This is Ned from Burlington, New Jersey, who said... There's talk of Drew Aller being more of a running threat under Andy Kotelnicki. Do you think that's the case, and is it a good idea? <laughs> yes, I do think it is the case. This is something I've been talking about since the first practice and this off season. So, again, Ned, if you want to be in the know about what I know about this, BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. I've done a ton of film rooms over the last two weeks talking about not just – um, that Drew Aller is going to be more of a runner, but where? Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm rarely like proud of. Hey, I did that, but I think the conversation about Drew being a runner started when I said, "Oh, they're running that drill to start practice. That means something very important about this offense." So yes, he's absolutely going to be more of a runner, and I don't think it means he's going to get hurt. I think it means that he is going to have the opportunity to get the yards that are there. They got to use him judiciously, but he has to be better about keeping the football. So it is a balanced conversation of Drew's going to be more of a runner, but he doesn't need to be uh, Will Levis. Very good, T. Frank. That's it for quarter number three. We got more to talk about. Come back for quarter number four. Hello and welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. It is quarter number four. He is T. Frank. I am Jim. We are approaching very quickly the spring football game t frank and if you're ready to upgrade your tailgate experience it's time for revel xp if you want to tailgate close to the stadium with pen tables chairs ice all of that ready and waiting for you when you arrive you got to check out revelxp.com they could even help you out with your catering and by the way we at keystone sports we always like to tailgate with Revel XP. So check out RevelXP.com. That's R-E-V-E-L-X-P.com. And you too can experience turnkey tailgating. T. Frank. All right. We did a lot of time with the um, offensive line in the first couple segments. We then did our Ask T. Frank. 
I just want to throw in one quick note because everybody knows I went crazy week after week during the fall season that Drew Aller, they would run those read options, but mm-hmm. Drew Aller never kept the ball. And it's no, it's not that I want to see uh, Drew Aller run the ball 20 times a game, but how about he just be a threat? Just pull yeah. the ball enough times that the defense has to respect that that's a possibility, T. Frank. Yeah, and that's that's a lot of the a core principle in how Andy Kotelnicki is able to create this dynamic explosive offense does feature the threat of a quarterback run. So it is intrinsic. One of the reasons that they're running more than I expected is because it's more intrinsic than I expected. Where they've done it without they've they've done this without um the the running threat from the quarterback. But if you're talking about this being a multi-year process where you want to establish an offensive identity and culture at Penn State, you have to look beyond Drew. You have to do what's best for Drew and have him be successful. But there are other parts of the offense that you can highlight his his skills. Um, so you need to have that balance of what's good for Drew, but what's good for not just Bo Perbula, but Ethan Gronkmeyer and Jackson Smolik are, are athletic enough that they can uh, succeed in this offense. If Penn State is able to land Matt Zollers or, or um, Washington, I forget his first name, I apologize, the quarterback from Maryland, one of their four-star possibly... Washington. Malik Washington, thank you. I thought that was, but I, for some reason, I just par- I was paralyzed in the moment of like, oh, is that is that the name I wanted? Yes, Malik Washington. Any of those guys that have the athleticism to be in this offense in the future, I know that you can't guarantee that a guy is going to come to that. Andy Cole Nicky will be there in three years, but you don't want to start with the end in, uh, with with the short term end in mind. That's you know that's how you get into a situation where none of your players fit your offense after the coordinator leaves. So they need to they need to have this balance of the, just that the idea that Drew can run more, but they're not building the offense just for Drew. They have to be built for Penn State. Same conversation that they've had about tailoring the offense to what the players on the roster can do on both sides of the ball. And it, this is not black and white. There are shades of gray. Again, I always use the phrase he needs to be a threat to run the ball. All yeah. right, T. Frank. Let's get to our quarter four topic. We talked so much offensive line. I want to talk a little bit about the running backs. We all know Nick Singleton, Katron Allen, they're the guys. Perhaps the most interesting part of the running back conversation is who's going to be that third guy. But let's start with Singleton and Allen. First of all, no no player is perfect. What could those two guys work on? Uh, (laughs) Um. I want to see where Nick is as a receiver, where he got better last year, but he still was robot running back sometimes catching the football. It, it looked light years better than when he was a freshman, but is it natural now? Like, what has his what has his athletic growth been where he he's such a dynamic athlete that his, has he learned those um, bedrock skills where receiving the ball is now easy, like looks easy, not thinking about catching the football so you can focus on other things like your route running and, you know, making sure you are breaking tackles and being explosive. So that's part of it. Um, and then from the running game perspective, I think we we talked enough about him being harder to tackle. Part of that is going to be having better angles, having better opportunities. And then from Katron's perspective, it's just about how much juice can you get out of your physical abilities? Just maximize what you can do. And, uh, you know, both those guys are in the weight room. They're on the field. They are the hard, some of the hardest workers on the team. So I, I don't think either of those, you should be overly concerned about them not progressing as football players. I know we've talked about this before in different ways, but I'll ask it anyway. How do you think uh, Andy Kotelnicki will use them differently to accentuate those skills? Um, the idea that the off so this is this is the balance of the conversation where sometimes James Franklin says one thing and half of the Penn State fans that I talk to freak out and then he says another thing and then half of the Penn State fans freak out the other way that the offense is going to stay <laughs> the running game is the running game like it, they didn't they're not changing a whole lot but they're going to be doing a bunch of different things on top of that and that's where again I went into the film and I broke down what that means the base running plays zone running plays we talked about that earlier that's staying the same. And, and that is not, there are only so many ways to, to cut an apple, right? So there are only so many ways to slice a pie. There are only so many running schemes in football. 
So the basis of what Andy Kolnicki does is very similar to what Mike Yersich does and did. And he finally got there in his third year where they were running more pure zone inside, outside, mid. Andy Kolnicki is going to do that. They're going to have, I think, if they can do it, if they can accentuate this in the run game, more pulling and more um, not just those core concepts. They'll do more diverse things in the run game. So that should give Penn State's running backs the opportunity to have more advantageous angles and the offensive line more advantageous angles on their blockers to create more of those explosive plays and to be uh, better at generating consistent yardage and not having to fight so hard for four yards. Um, so that's where I think Andy Kolnicki can accentuate their skills is give them better opportunities through the scheme and formation and all that stuff. And you want to see how all that works again, bluewhiteillustrated.com. You can go to T Frank's film room and see the, the recent one that I put up about how motions and shifts and things that are very trendy in the NFL right now, how they influence the defense to create opportunities to, um, give the quarterback an easy run or to lighten the front side of a run so that there are better opportunities for those guys to make plays and to get extra yards. Okay, T. Frank, perhaps the more interesting conversation when talking about the running backs is who is going to be that third running back. Let's go through the candidates a bit. Uh, there's a couple of shirt freshmen, second-year players. They are Landon Montgomery, who was out of Scranton Prep. If you remember, he had the uh, serious knee injury in high school. So we never expected to see him um, in his true freshman year. And the other redshirt freshman was Cam Wallace. He's a running back out of Georgia. Now, if James Franklin's conversation from, uh, I guess it was the first day of spring practice, is any indicator, it seemed like London Montgomery, he was concerned that he hadn't gotten bigger, yeah. where he talked about Cam Wallace changing his body, getting big enough and strong enough to play in the Big Ten. From that conversation, I would assume Cam Wallace has a leg up on London Montgomery. Yeah, absolutely. Right now, and really since the beginning of their time at Penn State because of the injury you talked about, um, Cam Wallace is running back three on the, on the depth chart. And this is the problem is London is an excellent running back. He is really good at football and James Franklin said that when he gets on the field he does good things for us but he's 186 pounds and that really hasn't changed since he got here and that was you know one of those not so subtle messages in the public of London we love you but you you got to get bigger like you got to put the work in the weight room in order to be a football player on the football field and we we love the potential and we don't want you to get passed over but there are things that have to happen and i think that's a a fair that's a fair thing to say like that's the reality at every position and you know i've talked to london a couple times on on the show i think he is a really thoughtful smart kid i think he's aware of these things but i wonder after two uh serious injuries in, in high school like just what's his confidence that when he goes down into a squat that it's not going to do something so you know again conversation speculation but there's something holding him back from being bigger and stronger and, and doing the natural developing that all of these these players do in the Penn State weight program and the thing with with uh London is he's not a huge dude so it's not like he has a massive frame to begin with so he has to maximize all of the things in his profile in order to be you know, Big Ten running back. This is the again, that's the that's the concern of a guy who isn't 200 pounds coming out of high school. Like there are growth concerns. There is that fear of uncertainty and, and certain fans want guarantees at every position with five star players. That's the difference is like you believe London can grow. He's got to make good on that promise. So right now, you know, I, I saw in February, I saw Cam Wallace in person and he is really impressive. Like he has he, he's the other opposite. He's the opposite side of the conversation where he has done everything in order to be big and strong and play at five, nine, he's almost 200 pounds and, and really well built. And so when you look at that too, those two players second year in the system, specifically cam Wallace, would have an advantage, not over, not only over London Montgomery, but the true freshman. However, that never lets the Penn State yeah. fans <laughs> <laughs> stop their conversation. And Quentin Martin, he because I part of this is he's a Pennsylvania recruit. More fans are familiar with them. They got very excited about Quentin Martin and the fact that he spent time at wide receiver. As you well know, that caused 
us fans to go crazy. Maybe he could be the help in the wide receiver room. But let's talk about Quentin Martin. What do they have there? And might we see him in his true freshman season on the field? So this is where it helps to go into the film and to look at what uh, Andy Kolnicki has done on offense to understand where are the opportunities, where are the, and I, I wrote about this on Monday, where are the sub packages where players have roles and there are reps to be gained. So last year, or I'm sorry, in 2022, and then in 2023, we saw some 30 personnel, three running backs, zero tight ends. So that is, that is a, a unique lineup, but they were able to generate some great plays out of that. So generally, in general, two running back situations, two running back sets are something that Andy Kolnicki uses a good bit. 21 and 22 personnel is something that he's used in the past often, more often than other teams. When you have two backs on the field, you need to have four total. Just because if those, you know, if something happens, you need to have guys ready to go so that you know, your number four becomes your number three. Quinton Martin has the opportunity to be a receiving back. Like, it's not that his receiving is unhelpful or it's not useful. It's you, you don't want to overemphasize it to the point of saying, like, he's now going to be a slash player coming out and being Debo Samuel to start. Like, maybe someday he can get there, but let him learn a position and then learn a second position because Debo Samuel didn't do all that running back stuff until he got to the NFL. He was a full-fledged wide receiver before he did any of the other things. So a receiving back... In this offense with two tight, two running back sets a lot, he does have an opportunity to earn some reps and sub packages if they need that skill. And he does have a unique skill as a, as a receiving threat out of the backfield. That, I think, is where he can carve a role for himself. Um, but he's got to fight Cam Wallace to get into those shares because you would think he would have the leg up at this point. T. Frank, that's going to have to be it. Thank you for all the great information, T. Frank. Thank you all for listening. Make sure you join us next time on the Keystone Kickoff Show.